The mid-90s were a weird time for metal. Even pioneers Metallica, who went pretty commercial with 1991's The Black Album, followed it up with an even more commercial record with 1996's Load and the following year's Reload, not to mention a full image makeover with shorter hair, more artsy album covers, and videos. To some fans, it was a betrayal, or worse, selling out. But that's something Pantera fans could never say about their band. With each release, Pantera seemed to fly in the face of whatever was popular at the time. And as metal seemed irrelevant by 1996, the band would proceed to write their heaviest record yet, with their 8th studio album The Great Southern Trend Kill. The band's previous release, 1994's Far Beyond Driven, was an album that surprised many people when it debuted at the number one spot on the Billboard charts. The album didn't get much love from rock radio or a lot of attention from MTV, so some wondered, where could the band go next? Pantera would begin work on their follow-up record in the fall of 1995, perhaps against their better judgment. But their record label wanted a new record with bassist Rex Brown telling Guitar World, we were all so burned out by that point, a lot of the discipline and structure we used to have went out the window. Pantera's songwriting process up until this point saw guitarist Dimebag Daryl bring tapes of riffs to the band, where they would proceed to write fully fleshed out songs. But things were different this time around, according to Brown, who would recall to author John Wiederhorn. Dime used to bring a riff tape in and say, okay, here's what we have to work with, and that wasn't happening as much, as the riff tape was wearing out, so we just go in there and all start playing. It's funny because kids go, Great Southern was the best record you ever put out, and I go, how could that be, because it happened in such an off-the-cuff way. We didn't even go back and re-record it, he would say. But Dimebag told a different story when he was interviewed by Guitar World, revealing that some of the riffs off the album were old, including fan favorite Floods, which dated back to the group's club days in 1988, when he would improvise solos on stage, while some of the other riffs dated back to the early 90s. The band's original plan was to record the album in Dallas, about 45 minutes from Dimebag's Arlington home, but as the guitarist told Guitar World in 1996, those plans changed, recalling, I've got to tell you, bro, I wasn't into the idea at all. You know, you wake up, you jump into your hot rod, but by the time everybody's made it to the studio, somebody's hungry, so you got to go out and get a bite to eat. That leaves you unmotivated. So you sit around and watch the big screen TV, play pool and drink beer. I didn't want that to happen, so we just did it here. It was following the band's last tour that the guitarist built a studio in a barn in his backyard called Chase and Jason Studios. With them adding to Guitar World, it started off as a jam room, but then we decided to do our demos here, so we brought in some gear. The demos were so tough and lethal sounding that we were like, man, that's almost it, right there. But not everything went smoothly in the makeshift studio, as bassist Rex Brown recalled to Wiederhorn. He put up three walls and made a studio inside of it. It was quite an experience. We had built all these ISO caps to get the sound down, but we had a huge face control problem. That's why it's called Chase and Jason Studios, because there was always something effing wrong. There was buzz going around the whole effing place. And that on top of the fact that we were making our most experimental record ever, something that sometimes didn't even have a coherent structure to it made us all crazy. But the band's recording plans soon hit a wall. While frontman Phil Anselmo was present for the demos, he was dealing with serious back pain. He wasn't interested in getting surgery due to the long recovery time, which could have lasted anywhere from a year to a year and a half. So instead, the frontman self-medicated, turning to heroin and painkillers. Anselmo soon isolated himself from the rest of the band, setting up shop in New Orleans at Trent Reznor's Nothing Studios, while the rest of the band remained back in Texas. Drummer Vinnie Paul would tell John Wiederhorn, Phil was going through a lot of mental distress and it's all on that record. You can feel the pain, you can see it, you can hear it, and it affected all of us, no doubt. And Selma, for his part, would tell the Do You Know Jack radio show, his thinking behind recording separately from the band, recalling, On a personal level, I wasn't doing all that well because I was injured. I was making every rookie mistake in the world with pain medication and all that stuff, and I was embarrassed. I didn't want to see anybody, man. I was in a bad way. But Anselmo's bandmates knew what he was up to, as Rex Brown soon noticed he was getting involved in harder drugs. Manager Walter O'Brien would recall in the book Reinventing Metal, it was a constant conflict. It was like pulling teeth. By Great Southern Trendkill, he made Dime fly back and forth with the master tape so he could add vocals and make musical suggestions. That was the real start of the end. 
Phil wanted to stay in New Orleans, communication fell apart, cooperation was non-existent, and the tone of the album is depressing and confrontational. To this day, I can't listen to the album at all because of what went down during its recording and touring. Released on May 7, 1996, the Great Southern Trend Kill made it clear that Pantera wasn't going to dilute their sound, and they didn't care whether people thought metal was dead or not. This was Pantera doubling down, and it proved to be the band's hardest album to date with Anselmo's lyrics taking aim at the media, as well as drugs, and about a flood that wipes out humanity. The album would debut at number 4 on the Billboard charts, moving nearly half a million copies before fading away. Billboard magazine wrote the album off as a commercial disappointment, as it initially failed to match the success of the group's previous effort. The label attempted to release the song Floods to Rock Radio in an effort to revive slagging sales, with Greg Thompson, the senior VP of promotion, telling the magazine, Pantera makes no excuses for what they do. From a promotional standpoint, we did everything we could to further their exposure. Pantera is like fish. A lot of the group's fan base are not active radio listeners. Our job is to increase their base. The album would end up going gold, and nearly a decade later it was certified platinum. The same problems that plagued the recording of the record also came back to haunt the group while they were on the road. At a homecoming show on July 13, 1996 at the Coca-Cola Starplex in Dallas, Texas, Anselmo would suffer a drug overdose and be brought back to life by paramedics. Four days later, the singer issued a press release to the media, and he would talk to MTV about the incident when he was interviewed on Headbangers Ball, as you can see here. Headbangers Ball, definitely. So we're glad to be here. So Phil, um, if I could come to you now about um, the incident that happened. I mean, that really, really must have shaken you up really badly. How are you feeling? It didn't really shake me up. I uh, overdosed. You know, everybody makes mistakes, but I truly learn from my mistakes, and I have that ability to turn that light switch off. And I'm going to keep that particular light switch off in my life forever. Good, I'm very pleased to hear that. Yeah. And you said in your statement that it made you realize what you really valued in your life. Pantera, it's very yeah, true, very friends. true. I used to wake up and dread the day, you know. Wake up, every time I go to bed, I'd just be like, ugh, I can't really face tomorrow. And really, it was uh, not me speaking, it was... Uh, depressants, so to speak. So, uh, you you know, it's basically common sense. It's, it's tough at the time when you're going through something like that. It's tough to see the big picture, but it's pretty easy. Omit that stuff, live happier, you know? So, and it's just all natural to me. In a weird way, too, it, it brought us all a lot closer together. And Very much so. We've taken it not as a negative, but as a positive. You know, it's made us better on stage. It's made us closer as people and as friends too you know so you know always you know there's bad things in this world but hey if you can take them and turn them into some good so be it absolutely. absolutely but on that same note after i'd overdosed the very next night we played the next night there's no rehab there's no uh trial period of, of getting the whole band back together we never lost a step and uh I think that took a lot of character from everybody on our crew and our band and stuff, and I think that, you know, they deserve to be uh, commended on that, and I, I thank them. He would tell VH1's Behind the Music that he had an enormous amount of shame and relapsed a few more times since then while he was with Pantera. In the years that followed, Anselmo would refer to the album as a dark horse record for the band, and Vinnie Paul would look back saying he had trouble listening to the album given the circumstances it was recorded under. But musician Moby would defend the album telling classic rock, it's so unrelentingly dark, the lyrics of Warner are the most unrelentingly evil lyrics you can imagine. They make church-burning Norwegian Satanists sound like Sunday school teachers. And Selma would tell the Do You Know Jack radio show how the band's manager warned the group not to expect sold-out crowds on their tour due to the state of heavy metal, recalling, 
our road manager approached me and he said, Phil, you know, man, don't expect sold out shows. Heavy metal's on his way out. Kids are listening to different stuff and it's going to be rough. Don't expect this. Don't expect that. And I was like, great. I appreciate the pep talk. But the best thing that remedied this bullshit diatribe was that he was dead wrong. That first show was packed to the gills, sold out, as were most of the other ones. I think as a perfect segue when we cover Pantera's follow-up and final album, Reinventing the Steel, would be something that bassist Rex Brown told John Wiederhorn, saying, I'm still not crazy about two or three songs on there, but there's a lot of good stuff on there. After we made that record, Phil got his expletive together and we toured. We were one of the biggest bands out there. We did the second Ozfest, which was great money, and we played through 98, and then we did the Black Sabbath reunion in 99. By the end, we were all completely worn out and we needed a break, but every time we tried to stop, something came up that we couldn't turn down. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Story Sticker.